Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wiradjuri people, um, and also acknowledge traditional owners of the land from across the Murrumbidgee region and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and Aboriginal people here with us today. I just want to talk very briefly about, um, for those LHAC members that, that may be a little newer, um, about the role of the PHN, um, and I, I will keep this short. Um, as a primary health network, we really have three core roles. We're one of 31 PHNs who are federally funded. Um, and those three roles are there on the slide, but essentially it's to fund health services to meet needs in community. And we currently fund um, around 62 providers across the region. And that boundary and region uh, we actually share with the LHD. So we're very fortunate to have a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with our local health district. The other role we have is around integrating and coordinating services. And I think the collaborative um, commissioning presentation was actually a really good example of some of the work that we're doing in integration um, and coordination of, of health service. It's, it's a huge piece of work. Um, and there are many other examples that I know we've shared um, at this LAC forum, but also at others. The third role we have is to support general practice. And we touched a little bit on some of the PHN's role yesterday around supporting general practice um, in terms of recruitment um, and retention and succession planning around workforce. Um, but the other role we have is to support quality improvement in general practice. Um, we do that by supporting general practice with accreditation and the provisions of, of tools and resources that support general practice um, to provide care to the communities across our footprint. Um, our vision as a PHN is uh, well people and resilient communities. And we've heard a lot, I was reflecting this morning, we've heard a lot about resilience um, over the last two days and certainly was highlighted by our keynote speakers at last night's event. Um, Tom said yesterday, we live in a time where harnessing happiness can be challenging. And I think that's been very true of um, the challenges we've all faced in the last couple of years. I think resilience is something we refer to a lot and um, has certainly come up a lot in the last couple of years. When I reflect on resilience and what that means um, and how I've seen it look in the Murrumbidgee and in our communities is that resilience often comes from within communities and that support that um, communities provide each other, the support and role that, that you all play in your communities um, as a member of your community and certainly as LHAC representatives. Um, I just wanted to um, just say thank you to all of the LHACs here for the important role um, that you do play in your communities. Um, it's, it's certainly really inspiring and I think it was, um, I just have a, a comment here that I wrote down yesterday, it was Keith from Gundagai and, he's, and hopefully it's Keith, isn't it? I've got your name right, great. Um, he said, we've been um, pretty quiet like a lot of people and then went on to speak about all of the amazing work happening in Gundagai and then um, in the open mic sessions yesterday there were plenty more examples of people who have not been busy um, doing incredible work uh, including the establishment of the Avondale Respite Centre at Henty. Um, the establishment of Facebook pages, um, and the list goes on and on. So I was quite inspired yesterday um, by the amazing work happening across our communities, um, but also how incredibly humble our LHACs are in, in the work that they do. Um, so a, a very um, sincere thank you from, from me to you for all of that work and the support that you provide uh, the PHN in, in carrying out our work. Um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of um, areas that we have been focusing on. Um, and I'll just talk very briefly about COVID. Um, there's some key stats on there, but what I really want to highlight is um, the work of our primary care providers 
And if you have a look at the number of doses that have been administered in primary care, um, that's really significant. So this work is in addition to all of the work that already happens uh, in, in general practice in our communities. Um, the other really big thing that happened uh, with COVID at the begin beginning of this year was um, the transition of care um, to the community and GPs taking on um, an increased role in the management of COVID positive patients in the community. Uh, that's been very significant as we know GPs are, are very crucial in the, the role of uh, in caring for people in the community. Um, but in addition to that, there was a lot of work undertaken by general practices to establish processes and systems to support COVID positive patients. And, and I'm sure you've all seen that as you've accessed your local general practice, whether that's um, the establishment of outside based clinics or uh, waiting in your car to be called in. There's a lot of processes and systems that, that go into establishing these models. Um, in terms of integration, uh, when we were looking at their transition of care, we did uh, co-fund or we funded a position that actually sits in the patient flow unit. Um, and that's a primary care liaison position and any of our GPs across the region when they have a COVID positive patient um, that they need to, to discuss or escalate can call that primary care liaison position um, in the patient flow unit. Um, and that's, that's a direct link in. Um, the other key area of work that I wanted to focus on was our primary care engagement role. Um, and just some key highlights there. So in up until March this year from July, we've provided uh, 1,908 practice engagements. Um, and what you will see um, is the difference there between remote support and in-person visits. Uh, COVID allowed us or uh, challenge us, I think, to look at how we provide support to uh, general practice in the region. And you'll see um, a, a reasonable proportion there of 80% of those engagements are remote. So we've really been able to enhance the support that we provide to general practice. Um, we continue to support recruitment as we discussed yesterday. Um, but I also wanted to note um, health Pathways. So Health Pathways um, is a, a joint initiative between the PHN and the LHD. And it's a system that it supports general practice at the point of care with um, diagnosis, management and referral of patients. Um, so you might be sitting in front of your GP uh, and there might be a particular condition and your GP can go through the health pathway and that will provide referral details from across the, for across the region. Um, it's, a, it's had 28,472 page views, but I might just go back because you can see that 6,200 of those were related to COVID specific pathways. So these are pathways that um, support GPs in the management of COVID positive patients. Um, just some other key highlights just in terms of some areas of our work. Um, we've continued to provide support um, to bushfire affected communities and youth based grants. So we've provided over $1.7 million in funding across 328 community, um, community grants. Um, and some of those community grants recipients have, were of course challenged. Um, with COVID at some point or another. So that did either delay or change some of those activity, but I think it's really pleasing to see the number of activities um, that are delivered within community at a community level. Uh, we do have um, a reasonable proportion of our funding uh, where we fund mental health services. And I'll talk briefly in a minute about um, the future of some of the mental health services in the region and, and recent funding announcements. A couple of the uh, key areas that I just wanted to focus on in terms of activity that you might see coming to your communities in the near future. Um, we've recently received aged care funding and we, uh, we are expecting some more aged care funding shortly. Uh, the funding we currently have received, which is the most recent funding, um, is in the process of being rolled out at the moment. 
And that funding has been made available in response to the outcomes of the Royal Commission. One element of that funding is to support healthy ageing um, in communities. So we are commissioning a provider to undertake that work across the region. And then we have um, other areas which are focused on supporting telehealth in residential aged care facilities um, and after hours access um, in residential, GP after hours access in residential aged care facilities as well. Um, so really important work. Um, it is a great area of need um, and as that uh, funding and, and those activities are, are being rolled out, uh, we will share that with you. Uh, at this stage, that funding will be delivered over four years and we've heard today about some of the challenges of um, short-term funding cycles. Um, it's something that we continue to advocate to government around the challenges of implementing programs on the ground when funding cycles are short. Um, and the appetite of people to deliver, providers and organisations to deliver those services, um, and the uncertainty that that provides to their staff, to community. Um, so that, that is something that, that we do continue to feedback. Um, there are a couple of uh, key items in the federal budget that I wanted to highlight as well um, from, I think the federal budget was a couple of weeks ago now, it's all becoming a bit of a blur. Um, the 10-year primary health care plan was announced um, and under that one of the, the big items was um, $512 million to telehealth, make telehealth a permanent feature of the system. Um, looking at what is being funded locally, there was an announcement um, regarding mental health and suicide prevention and uh, our PHN will be receiving funding to establish a suicide regional response leader in the Murrumbidgee region and then funding to support activities related to suicide prevention. Um, that funding of course has been rolled out to all 31 PHNs nationally but I, I think um, is something that um, is, is really needed. It's, um, I know we've presented on previous forums, it's some of our work in suicide prevention. Um, of course, we, we need to continue with our COVID response um, and there was ongoing funding uh, committed to, to that in the budget as well. Um, and new funding from the government um, for targeted measures to support uh, women and girls who have had experience of violence and or sexual assault. So we're still waiting on further information about what that looks like, but there will be, uh, we understand, an EOI process from the federal government um, where we can apply for that funding. Um, just briefly, I wanted to touch on, because we do talk about the One Health System approach, I think, at every LHAC forum. Um, we've heard about collaborative commissioning today. Um, I think last forum uh, we introduced the enhancing paediatrics model and that work is continuing. Um, so we now have a number of general practices engaged and with the LHD we've co-commissioned a community paediatrician to enhance paediatric care um, in general practice. And I think this is really important because it means that people can then access a paediatric care and support closer to home. So with the models that we're looking at around uh, in our joint commissioning and integration, the focus is how do we best meet the needs of community as close to home as possible. So really looking at um, place-based initiatives on the needs of local populations. Um, I think the, the other area that will really drive a, um, a reasonable proportion of our work in the next little while is um, the recently signed New South Wales um, New South Wales bilateral agreement. So uh, that's in mental health and suicide prevention. And um, of all the states and territories, I think New South Wales has one of the biggest commitments um, with that bilateral ag agreement. Um, I think it totals around $383 million in investment in um, mental health and suicide prevention. There are a couple of things that we will see. So the continuation of the Way Back service. So that's a service that has been established, I think Anita, I get, I'm just not if I'm wrong, but I think it's around three or four years now, the Way Back. Yes, that's a thumbs up. Um, so it is really pleasing to see 
um, that initiative continue. The Way Back Service provides support to people in the first three months after a suicide attempt when they are most at risk and looks at um, how people are supported uh, in the community. So a really critical service um, with, with ongoing funding. Um, the other area that may be of interest, we're waiting on advice around head to health centres. So um, I, I notice a few people have still got their, I don't have my band, I thought I had it on this morning, but a few people still have their bands on. So head to health, um, that band will get you to the website, uh, which is a, of course a digital platform. The government is also establishing head to health centres. Um, under the New South Wales bilateral agreement, there will be 14 new head to health centres um, in New South Wales. So we are waiting for details about the location of those centres. There were five announced. I can't remember, remember them all off to the top of my head, but they were outside our region and the continuation of uh, a couple of recently announced um, head to health centres, including in Lismore, which is of course flood affected, uh, flood affected and Penrith. So as that information comes to hand, uh, we will send that out to you um, through our LHAC newsletter and, and with our PHN reps that attend your meetings. Um, for anyone that's interested in further information on any of that, that funding or how that might impact your local community, I'm certainly happy to, to have those discussions. Um, but where I did want to spend a little bit of time, uh, what are the upcoming opportunities uh, for LHACs? So one of those opportunities is uh, we have released or are very close to releasing um, our community grants program, uh, um, which closes on the 20th of May. Um, so we've got up to $10,000 in funding available. Um, and this grant funding aims to um, look at social co cohesion and connectedness in communities um, and also uh, fund activities that enhance community wellbeing. So what does that mean and what does that look like in practice? Um, it could be health checks, um, it could be hosting wellness events, um, it could be hosting workshops. So we will send all of this information out to you, the slides will come out with, with some links. Um, but I think this is a really good opportunity if you see a need in your community um, to look at who you could partner with in your community to deliver on some of these events or, or an LHAC um, could also apply. So uh, really, really good opportunity to meet some of those um, needs and challenges that you see at a local level. Um, of course, um, we're currently going through our health needs assessment process and many of you will be familiar with conversations on the couch. Um, thank you to those towns who have already hosted us um, and supported us with engaging community in these events. They are a really good opportunity for us to hear about what's happening on the ground in a community. Um, the data is ev only ever one piece of the story and we have lots of that. Um, but what really is meaningful is the experiences that people share when we're sitting in a coffee shop in a community um, about the challenges that they face. And, and they're the things for me that really stick um, when we then look at redesigning or services or coming up with new initiatives. I am very excited to announce for those that of you have been to a previous pitch night. Um, in, at the September LHAC Forum, we will have another pitch night event. So that is an opportunity um, where we have dedicated funding and we hand over the decision to you about how we spend that funding. You'll receive a pitch, uh, usually from uh, three organisations about their initiative and then um, with funding and the checks that we give you, not real checks, paper checks, but the money counts, um, um, the money does count. You will pledge in, uh, usually I think last time we did in lots of 300, funding towards the initiatives that you think are deserving of the funding that we have. Um, so for those who attended our last pitch night, which was in 2019, um, um, it, was, it was a great event. Uh, and we did fund some amazing, amazing initiatives that really supported um, communities. Um, last but not least, uh, we are developing our new strategic plan. 
this is a really important document uh, for, for the primary health network and I think we have a lot um, in terms of the landscape that has changed in the last couple of years that we need to consider as we develop this plan. But I think what is most important is um, we will be coming out and engaging with LHACs directly and seeking your feedback as part of that strategic plan process um, and, and in providing that uh, to our board working group who is overseeing the development of that plan. Um, also something new I wanted to share, at conversations um, on the couch in Lockhart, um, I was chatting to Fran and Gay who had said they'd just recently started their Facebook page and uh, we got chatting about suitable content and where they could find it and wouldn't it be great to have um, an awareness calendar? So as a result of that, um, we went away and we've created an LHAC resource page. So this is available to all LHAC members. Um, we'll send the link around. It's not something you can find. It's not publicly available on our website. Um, but if you have that link, all LHACs will be able to access it. Um, on there is a annual awareness days calendar, as well as social tiles and uh, images that you can use freely on your Facebook, um, Facebook pages. So that includes um, things around uh, winter and influenza and hand washing um, and also mental health messaging. So thank you to Fran and Gay for your feedback and um, kicking, kicking that initiative off. Uh, importantly, if you've got feedback on this, please let us know, we can keep adding to it. Um, we want this to be a resource for, for you uh, as you administer your Facebook pages. Um, so please um, be very open with your, with your feedback to your PHN reps. Um, one of the last things I just want to mention is our Tell It Well series. And this is Peter, and I'll speak about Peter in a moment, who is our 18th storyteller. We first launched our Tell It Well series in 2019 um, as part of our Empowering Our Communities program. And that program was funded to support people, support mental health and wellbeing um, of people who were drought affected. And one of our first storytellers is actually with us. So John Harper was one of um, our very first storytellers. And I would say his feedback on that committee was really instrumental in us thinking about how do we reach people who might need support um, and share real experiences um, with our communities to really encourage people to seek support when, when they most need it. Um, so I'll now introduce um, Peter. Um, Peter shares his personal story with us and, and this is the first time that we've um, publicly shared this video. Um, he shares his ex lived experience of depression including what he has found helpful. Um, together with professional help, Peter has been uh, able to be involved in community groups which provide him with a sense of community and connection. My name is Peter McCallum. I'm 71 years of age. I've been married to my wife, Janine, for 45 years. We have four children, six grandkids. I worked for the bank for 27 years and once I got out of the bank, I brought a farm at a place called Oburn Creek, which is above Tarkata, and we had the farm for 21 years. When I was in the bank, things used to build up, and I couldn't sleep at night time, I'd be thinking about it. I thought, well, bugger it, let's be my own boss. When I got on the farm, everything was going good, and then the drought hit. And, well, that was a real good kick in the guts. I had to uh, find feed, money was short, cattle prices were down. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I spent a lot of time sleeping, trying to hide from the world is the thing. I didn't want sympathy. I just wanted understanding. Lucky I went to my doctor, and since then, my whole life changed. And I think my personality did too, because I wasn't grumpy anymore. In my spare time, I do honorary auditing for various groups. I'm involved in Family History Society in Wagga, the Museum Society in Wagga. I help with Country Hope. I'm also 
with the OMLI group. OMLI actually stands for Old Man New Ideas and I've been going to the group now about three years. We get together for a coffee, a bit of a chat. Um, we talk about what we've done the previous week, uh, any problems. We have had people there with mental health, but being able to get in a group and discuss things helps people. Omni to me is giving and sharing. You're there to help in any way possible and sharing your experience. If you've got depression, you don't want to be staying at home thinking about it. You know, you've got to get up, get up and do something and do things. Keep your mind going. You'll help yourself and you'll help your family. And then I guess your family will probably say, you're not a bad old so-and-so after all. We're incredibly grateful uh, to Peter for sharing, sharing his story and all of our other storytellers, I think. Um, Every time I uh, watch or re-watch the Tell It Well stories, I'm incredibly moved um, by people's stories, but also their courage to share their stories with others. So, are you our next Tell It Well storyteller? Or do you know who someone who is? So this is a great opportunity for you to identify those people, yourself or others in your community that um, others could benefit from hearing their story. Um, when we send out, a, we'll send uh, details onto section, but we will have contact details. We'll share these slides so uh, you can nominate someone. Um, I'd suggest talking to them first if it's not yourself, um, but nominate someone who may um, be willing to share their story with us.